All right, so my wedding day was the best day of my life. I can say that definitely. It was the best day of my life. It was a great day. My wedding day started off with my best friend, Brandon Leon, coming to my house with a drink in hand. And he was so clutch that day, all right? He was so clutch that day. He took very good care of me. He came, he helped me clean my apartment so that, you know, my wife wouldn't want to leave me on the first day of the rest of our lives. <laughs> and it was just amazing. He took such good care of me, though, that he forgot to get a haircut. <laughs> Look at this boy. He was so concerned about taking care of me that he, he didn't get a haircut. And so he is going to live like his, his Dragon Ball Z haircut <laughs> is going to live in Patterson family infamy forever. I have more pictures than this. I just didn't want to embarrass him too bad. Okay. It was, it was amazing. Actually, even my grandmama came up to me and was like, what's going on with that boy hair? And I was like, <laughs> it's like, grandma, you know, I'm sure it's a phase. Sure, it's a phase. We had enough gel. It was good. Another thing that happened is a couple months before uh, the wedding, one of my groomsmen, Steve Glippa, he, he and I were talking. He was like, man, you should wear Jordans in your wedding. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And so later I called Amy and I was like, do you know what Steve Glippa said? He said we should wear Jordans. He's crazy, huh? And Amy was like, I think that's a great idea. And I was like, word? <laughs> and the rest was history. All right. And we wore, we wore all white Jordan 13 retro lows that had black and lavender shoestrings. All right. It was glorious. All right. It was glorious. It was amazing. All right. Another thing about our wedding, uh, if you were at our actual ceremony, the most memorable moment of the ceremony was not the kiss. All right. The most memorable moment of the ceremony is when I was doing my personal vows and I just said the most embarrassing out-of-pocket thing to Amy in front of all the guests. And it was, so, it was so bad that even my sisters were blushing. My young sisters were blushing in the room. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I said, okay? It's not appropriate for this environment, all right? But let me just tell you, it was a very memorable moment. People still to this day can't believe I said what I said. Amen. Uh, from there, we went and we had our reception at a, uh, a community center, but the community center had a basketball court, and that's where we had our, our ceremony. Uh, and so an amazing thing that we did is all of our groomsmen, uh, they, so basically we, we came into the, the reception to the Chicago Bulls theme music. You guys remember that? It was the best. I, I mean, Amy is an amazing woman, okay? She really humored us. But as we went in, one of the guys, you know, because you kind of lead your, your bridesmaid in, and one of the guys, he ran full speed, and he jumped, and he grabbed the rim, which no other groomsmen wanted to be shown up. And so we all risked our lives and our reputations <laughs> running and in our tuxedos going and grabbing the rim. All right, it was, it was great. And then we danced. We, we danced until they kicked us out of the building. All right, this is, this is me and my, my cousins. We had a really good time. So it was a great day, right? And th this, is how, this is how weddings should be, right? It, it was such a great day for Amy and I that we decided to start a new tradition. We celebrate it every day on that day, okay? We call it a wedding anniversary, all right? <laughs> my dad jokes are getting really bad. I'm sorry. I'll try, to, I'll try to get them better. Wow. I'm so glad my kids aren't in the room. So, but weddings are supposed to be this way, right? They should be the best days of our lives, yeah? Uh, with all the effort and the money that a lot of us spend, I mean, it, it better be, right? It better be a very good day. Um, and so, as much as I anticipated my wedding day, no wedding has greater anticipation as the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. And so, the Bible starts, think about this, the Bible starts with the wedding, and it ends with the wedding. But the wedding at the end of time is going to be the party of all parties. All right. No eyes have seen. No ears have heard. No minds have actually conceived what this banquet is going to be like. All right. It is going to be the eschatological inbreaking of heaven's sovereignty. It is going to be 
an amazing, amazing event. And so as we wind down this series about finding honey in the rock and uh, as we've been learning how to abide in the wilderness, I just want to camp on this idea of abiding for a little bit longer. You know, and as the Thanksgiving countdown is, is happening and all of us are getting ready to feast, uh, I just want to take some time today to consider the ultimate feast that is to come to this invitation-only royal banquet that is being thrown by the God of heaven. Amen? Are you guys good to, to go with me on this? All right, so we're going we're gonna to look at a parable today. Uh, that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, And at this point in Matthew's account, uh, Jesus has done his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's entering the last days of his life and he knows it. Uh, He goes to the temple and he flips over the tables. He kicks out the money changers. He heals people. He begins to teach and the chief priests and elders approach him and they begin to question him, asking him this. They say, by what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you do these things? In other words, what they were saying was, we've worked hard to earn our positions, right? We've paid our dues to be able to represent God and to reap all the benefits. So Mr. Big Stuff, who do you think you are? Are y'all gonna wake up for me or am I have to do this the whole service? And to that, Jesus basically said, you know, this reminds me of a story. And he tells them three parables, one of which we're going to look at today. All right, so Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 2. This is what Jesus says, Jesus speaking. says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who held a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened cattle are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and they went their separate ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized the slaves and treated them abusively and then killed them. Now, uh, the king was very angry and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So go to the main roads and invite whomever you find there to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Verse 11. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, tie his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place for many are called, but few are chosen. Now from this parable, I want us to see a couple of things, three things. I want us to see the priority of the attendees, I want us to see the posture of the attendees, and then we'll finish with the preparation of the attendees. Amen? So first, the priority of the attendees. So this parable begins with a king who invites some contingent of privileged people in his kingdom to his son's royal wedding. Now, now this was not just going to be any party. This would have been one of the most important events in the history of the kingdom, right? Seeing the prince and the eventual king take uh, wedding vows and sharing in such a moment would be an incredible honor for the people of this kingdom. Uh, but, but since we're all American, I, I want to make sure this doesn't get lost on us, right? So this culture is not like our culture. In our culture, when you're throwing a party, you send out RSVPs, right? Okay, you send out RSVPs and, and you send out save the dates, right? We tell people we're throwing a party. It's going to be on this day at this time in this location, all right, that's not how it worked in this culture, right? In this culture, a king would send his servants to tell everyone, I'm preparing a banquet for my son, a royal wedding for my son. And then he would send servants later to say, everything is prepared, now it's time to go. That's how this worked, right? And so it's important to note how the people responded, all right? Because when they were told to come, at first it says they were unwilling to come. Right? He said, the banquet's ready, come. And they said, no, 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 thank you, we're, we're good. 
we're good. And so confused by their unresponsiveness, he sent service again with a clear message. Everything is ready. Everything is ready. It's all prepared. Come to the wedding feast. But they intentionally ignored the second time. They intentionally ignored the announcement and preoccupied themselves with the work of their farms and businesses, which when compared to what they were being invited to was a way of saying that they preferred to do anything to avoid coming to this banquet. Others took it further by abusing and killing the servants, that they responded with hostility and a declaration of war. And so what's going on here? What's going on? One way to interpret what Jesus is saying here is to assume that he's talking about the response of the unbeliever to his call of salvation, right? And to the unbeliever, some decline, some ignore, and some declare war, right? This is true, but what I believe that what Jesus is doing here is more than that, as evidenced by the fact that he's actually telling this story to the religious folks in this community, right? And the folks that this king was initially inviting to this banquet in his story, these are friends of the king. And so I think that Jesus is getting on to something more, and, and we as the people of God need to look at what he's trying to say. I think there's something for our hearts here. And so this is what I want us to see. When you gave your heart, when you gave your life to Jesus, it was a way of saying to God, I'm coming. You said, I'm coming. When you come to church, you're saying to God, I'm coming. When you throw yourself intentionally into community and doing life with other believers, you say, I'm coming. When you got baptized, it was your way of saying, I'm coming. When you take communion, what you're saying is, I'm coming. This is what you're doing. You're saying, I'm coming. And these are all ways of saying to God, you have called me, I'm coming. But it's important to note that the default mode of the unaided human heart is always trending towards hostility. It's always trending towards hostility. And in order to actually come to the banquet when we're called, you and I must prioritize it. We have to prioritize it. We must feast now. We must abide now or else we will find ourselves on the slippery slope of declining, of ignoring, and then warring, right? The psalmist talked about this in Psalm 14. Uh, Paul even echoed it in Romans 3 when they said that there is no one who seeks God. There's no one who seeks God, which means that there is this rebellion in every human heart. Right? There's rebellion in every human heart. You know, one way to define sin is to call it practical atheism. That's one way to define sin. That, that, is, that, that when we sin, one way of looking at it, it's acting as if God is not there. Amen. And so don't underestimate the power of the spiritual entropy of your heart. All right, so this is the, you know, the, the second law of thermodynamics. All right, now I didn't do that well in science in school, but I do remember this one, okay? All right, entropy. All right, simply stated, all things fall apart. Entropy. Amy and I, we, uh, we grilled an amazing tri-tip last week. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, chef's kiss. All right. All right, it's not as good as Brandon's sous vide, but I'm doing my best. It was a great tri-tip, but here's what we know, that if we were to take that tri-tip off the grill and put it on the counter, we all know this, that in a couple of hours, it's cold. And in a couple of days, it's unpleasant. In a couple of weeks, it's moldy. In a couple of months, it's rancid, and people who come into the environment and the atmosphere run the risk of getting really sick in a couple of years as a potential to kill you, amen? We all know this, right? Entropy, everything that begins well but is not tended to is trending towards breakdown and destruction. And so here's the question I have for you. When God, when God calls you, do you come? 
Do you feel conviction when you sin? And do you repent? Do you repair relationships when you hurt others? Do you approach your marriage, your parenting, your career, even your leisures with self-donation, right? How, how much can I give away or is it all about you? Is it self-absorption? How much can they give me? How much can I take? Because when it's actually time to come, if you are self-absorbed, this is what I want us to hear. If you are self-absorbed, you will only come if it serves you. So you can be known as someone who is close to the king. People may think that you are friends with the king, but you're really not. Just because you do the things Christians do, it doesn't, make, it doesn't mean you're feasting. It doesn't mean that you are a true friend of the king. See, Jesus had conflict. He had more conflict with religious folks than he did anyone else. And the reason why is they thought they were closest to God, but they literally could not recognize him when he was in their presence, right? You know, in the, the famous story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, I mean, we're surprised if, as we look closer, we're surprised to learn that there's actually two lost sons in that story. There's two lost sons and there's one son who begins the story lost and he ends the story lost and it's not the one who left and came back. You know which one it is? It's the one who was always in the father's house. I want us to look at this. This is important. Okay, let's look at this. Look what happens. Luke 15, verse 25. This is a part of this parable that we don't always hear, but it's very important for us. It says, now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Sounds like a party. Maybe even a banquet. Yeah. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what, things this, uh, what, what these things could be. And he said to him, the servant says, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because fattened calf, we've heard that before. He filled the ca- ki- killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to what? He was not willing to go in. He was not willing to go in. And his father had to come out and began pleading with him. So what happened here? The religious, self-righteous older brother wouldn't come to the party. Which is to say this, that just because you're always in the father's house, it does not mean you're not an orphan. I'll say it again. Just because you were always in the father's house does not mean you are not an orphan. You can still be lost. You can still be lost. He's calling you and you're not coming. Do not, do not, do not underestimate the power of the spiritual entropy of your heart. All right, God is calling to us. Prioritize this in your heart. Feast now. Abide in him as he abides in you. Otherwise, if we are not careful, we'll be on the slippery slope of declining, of ignoring, and then warring. Amen? Amen. So that is the priority of the attendees. Second, I want us to look at the posture of the attendees. So the, the king invites his friends or the people who are set apart and are supposed to be his friends to his son's royal banquet but they shrugged him off. So he said to his servants, go to the highways and byways, go to the main roads and invite whoever you see to come and enjoy the party. And so they go and they fill this banquet with a massive mix of diverse people, the rich and the poor, the old and the young, men, women, boys, girls, conservatives, liberals, immoral, moral, Broncos fans, Niners fans, Probably were no Raiders or Cowboys fans there. I, I don't think they're getting in. I'm just, that was inspiration from the Lord that just came. But there's time to repent, which is beautiful. But there's this, this mix of diverse people 
that are brought in to this banquet. But then the king comes into the banquet. Okay, it says bad and good people are brought in. The king comes and he's looking over the guests. And in verse 11, uh, he meets this man without wedding clothes on and he asks, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And in a similar way to how he had the murderers of his servants destroyed, he then had this man destroyed as well. All right, so what's going on here? What's going on? Now, many, many scholars, they look at this parable and they see it um, as two parts, right? There's two acts in this, in this parable, right? Verse two through 10, uh, they see as a substitution. And then verse 11 through 13, they see as a separation, right? And so this, this is also commonly seen as the history of salvation, right? That it came to the Jews first, right? They rejected it. And then we as Gentiles were engrafted in and we currently live at the end of verse 10 where many are being invited in. It's a, a way of looking at this parable. And in the second act of this parable, you have this man who comes into the banquet and he thought he could go right in. He, he thought he could go right into the king. He thought that his everyday wear was fine. He thought that he could come just as he was. And so more than forgetting to get a haircut, This brother didn't even have wedding clothes on, right? And his speechlessness says a lot about his posture, all right? It says a lot about his posture, all right? Now, now, there are two main reasons why anyone at this banquet wouldn't be wearing wedding clothes, all right? One reason is I don't have them because I didn't get a chance to go home and get it. The other reason is uh, I'm too poor to own wedding clothes, right? But this man says neither of those things. He doesn't say any of those things. He's speechless. And here's why I think that is. Because the original guests were invited in, in verse three or four and four of Matthew 22. They were invited with a lot of notice so that they could be ready for the banquet. But the second invitees were not given any notice at all. They were brought in without notice. So none of the guests would have had their wedding clothes with them. And even if they could, most of them likely couldn't even afford them which means that the king must have provided their wedding garments at his expense. He must have. And this guy, even though wedding clothes were available at the door, the reason why he couldn't say, well, oh, I didn't have the chance to go get them, nobody did. And the reason why he couldn't say, well, I couldn't afford wedding clothes, no one could. And so here's the point. The point is this, that there is a way to become a friend of God. And all you need is need. All you need is need. All you need is nothing, but most people don't have it. Most people don't have nothing, right? We want to pay for our salvation or at the very least, we want to contribute to it, right? And this is where a lot of people get God wrong, right? This is why the liberals think God is too conservative and why conservatives think God tends to be too liberal. It's the reason why God doesn't fit neatly into any of our boxes because on one hand, God says, I will take anyone. I'll take anyone. Anyone can come to the feast of my son. But on the other hand, God also says, uh, but, but you can't come as you are, right? You, you can't come just like you are. I'll have to clothe you myself. So we come into this royal banquet, not by being fit, but by admitting that we are not fit and letting God clothe us, which is to say that you and I can only feast when we understand that we don't deserve the meal. See, the wedding clothes are the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, we can miss this feast because of our priorities. And we can miss this feast because of our posture. I'm not talking to the lost world out there. I'm talking to us. We can miss this feast because of our priorities. And we can miss it because of our posture. See, whereas the initial invitees 
didn't come because they were preoccupied. This man, he couldn't stay because he was proud. He was proud. And here's the sad fate of the proud, right? And this is what I believe Jesus was getting to when he told these stories to the, 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 the religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders of that community. I believe this is what he was trying to get to them. The sad fate of the proud is this, that if you are proud, if you don't understand how desperately you need God to get God, and if you don't understand that access to him has nothing to do with you, then you will realize that you are ill-prepared for the very thing you say you're preparing for and headed to. In other words, you're coming in without wedding clothes. You're coming in without wedding clothes. And so we see the priority of the attendees. We see the posture of the, uh, the attendees. And we're going to finish with the preparation of the attendees. All right. How can we know that we are ready for this royal banquet? H- how can I know that when, when I get there, I won't get kicked out of the feast of the sun? How will I know that? Right? I've been telling you all service. The answer is feast now. Abide now. Right? This life as a believer is about preparing ourselves for this banquet. All right. And so let me just finish by giving you a few ways to know know how you're feasting now. Do you you guys want that? Would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be good. Some head shaking. Like you've been bumming me out this whole service. Help me out, brother. All right. And so I'm going to do this, um, and here's what we're going to do. So we're actually going to have our ushers. You guys can start passing down the communion elements. Um, our worship team, you guys can come back. Uh, and when I finish here, I'm going to have some of my great friends, Pat and Bev Tennant. They're going to come up and lead us in communion. Amen. So how do you know that you're feasting? All right. How do you know that you're feasting? Three things. Number one, the first way that you know you're feasting is you marvel at your salvation, all right? You marvel at your salvation, all right? Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones was this British uh, minister and doctor uh, that said that he could tell when he was in the presence of a true believer by asking one question. He would ask one question, you know what he would ask? He would say, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And he said that unbelievers would respond by saying something like, I'm trying. I'm trying, right? He knew that they had not, if they said that, encountered the gospel of grace because they were still thinking in terms of themselves. But whenever he would ask this question to a believer, they would say something like this. He would say, are you a Christian? And they would respond. They would say, can you believe it? Thanks, brother. They would say this, can you believe it? I am. Isn't it amazing? That's what they would say. They would marvel at the deal. And so the question is, do you marvel at your salvation? Are you amazed? Are you astonished? Are you thrilled? Uh, In this parable, the king's servants went out to the street corners looking for anyone they could find to come to this banquet. And, And these were folks who knew they had no business. Okay, they went to the highways and byways. The people that came into this banquet, they knew they had no business being at this banquet, they must have got there and said to themselves, oh my goodness, yesterday I was begging on the street and today I'm in the presence of the king. They must have said that. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, the Prince of Preachers, I I love that. I heard him say this in a a sermon once and I love it. He said, you always want beggars at your feast. You always want beggars at your feast. The prim and proper folks stick their noses up when the food comes out, but the beggars cheer for every dish, right? right. The turkey comes out and they're like, ooh, turkey, hooray for the turkey. The yams come out, yams? We're eating yams? Banana pudding? Right? They cheer for every dish, right? Do you do that? Do you do that? See, the banquet that God has prepared for you and has invited you to should evoke this sense that this is just too good to be true. I I don't deserve this. Someone paid a significant cost to me for me to get this, right? 
And so I want you to notice that the only person who gets thrown out of this banquet is not one of the bad people who were happy to put on a wedding garment, but it's the person who thinks he doesn't need it. And so if you are not a beggar cheering at every dish, it may be because you think that you have to work for it or you think you deserve it. All right. And so you know you're feasting, number one, if you marvel at your salvation, number two. You know you're feasting if you are content with what you have. You're content with the things you have. Now, I want to I wanna make this point just by looking at the subject of generosity. All right. Uh, contentment as a believer means you probably don't live the quality of life you could live because you don't think of your money as in how much of this do I get to keep, but how much of it can I give away, right? And only when you know that there's a banquet prepared for you, can you even begin to think this way? You know, I was reading the book of Acts in the last couple of weeks and in Acts chapter four, I just maybe have never paid good enough attention to it, but I was just astonished by Barnabas in that chapter because it says he sold this field that he owned and he took all the proceeds and he laid it at the apostles' feet. That is amazing. I mean, how many of, how many of us see that happen anymore? People sell their property and they give all the proceeds to the kingdom of God, right? And this was not just, you know, just a, a, a moment, right? We hear things like that and we think, oh, that's the exception. No, that was the rule. That was the rule during this time. That the selflessness selflessness of the early Christians in the Greco-Roman empire was so evident and overwhelming, it literally uh, lended tremendous credibility to the apostles' teachings, right? And it didn't end there because even a century later, a new emperor came up uh, named Julian. He came to power and he was upset at the growth of Christianity. And so what he did is he put a ton of energy and resources into renovating the pagan religions and it didn't work. And at one point he wrote this letter to one of his friends who was a pagan priest. And he was just complaining about the plight of what was going on here. And we still have this letter. And this is what he says to his friend. All right, this is important. He says, nothing has contributed to the progress of the superstition of these Christians as their charity to strangers. The impious Galileans provide not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. This was a distinction of believers, contentment. And so you know you are feasting when you are content with what you have. Now, let me put this negatively because I think it's gonna help some of us, okay? Not only are some of us not content with what we have, but many of us are always discontent. All right, our lives are full, but we're unfulfilled, guys. Have you, ever, have you ever loaned your sweater to a friend or a sibling that was just a little bit bigger in size than you and you got it back and it didn't fit you anymore? <laughs> Has that ever happened? If they're here in the room, don't say anything. <laughs> Only I get to roast my friends from stage, okay? All right. See, maybe you're discontent with everything and sin doesn't fit you the same because God has stretched your heart and it won't snap back. You're miserable, but perhaps your misery is a sign of God's faithfulness to you, right? Nothing you can acquire on this earth can compare to what he has for you at his table, all right? And so you know you're feasting, number one, when you marvel at your salvation. You know you're feasting, number two, when you're content with what you have. And lastly, you know you are feasting when your circumstances don't dictate the terms of your inner life. This is what this whole series has been about, guys. This idea of abiding in the wilderness. There's gotta, be, there's gotta be something on the inside of you, something that God is doing in you, no matter what your circumstances are. That does not change your inner life. Uh, Myrtle MacDonald was a, a Scottish chaplain that was captured by the Germans during World War II, and he was put in a prisoner of war camp he was captured alongside another Scottish chaplain and they separated the two and put one on the side of the fence with the British and the other on the side of the fence with the Americans. And as chaplains, they were allowed once per day to come together and speak briefly in front of the guards. Now, what they realized uh, eventually is that as they came and spoke in front of the guards, the guards were listening and the guards knew English, they knew French, obviously they knew German, um, but they didn't know the Scottish 
a, a native tongue. They didn't know Gaelic. Right, and so they started to speak in Gaelic with each other every day. And it turned out that one of the Americans had a homemade shortwave radio that the Germans didn't know about. And so every day, Myrtle would bring news to the gate. He would give it to the other chaplain. That chaplain would take it to the other side. And one day, Myrtle approached the gate, and in Gaelic, he said, Germany surrendered. The war is over. Now, the guards didn't know this because the communication had broken down. But that chaplain took that news to the other side to tell the British. And the next thing you know, they heard this loud cheer go up. I mean, everyone was just energized, excited about the news. Uh, and again, the guards had no idea. They had no idea what was going on. And Myrtle McDonald said, and this is what I'm trying to get to. He said, for the next four days, the guards had no idea the war was over. He said, we were still prisoners in a sense. He said, they were still pointing guns at us. He said, but, but, but we walked around as if we were at a party. We didn't complain about the food anymore. We didn't hate the guards anymore. Matter of fact, we felt sorry for them. That's what he said. He said, four days later, we got up and the guards were gone. They had gotten word and they opened up all the doors and they left. But this is what he said, and this is the point. He said, we were liberated by the news before we were liberated by the guards. They were free before they were fully free, guys. And so here's the point, that if you are not able to walk around no matter what prison you're in and smile at the guards, if you're not able to do that, then you truly do not know how complete your salvation is. Because if you are truly feasting now, if you are truly feasting now, your circumstances would not dictate the terms of your inner life. And so as we prepare to take communion, and as you have the bread and the cup in your hands, this is a great moment to answer David Martin Lloyd Jones's question. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And if based on what you've heard today, you would say, I don't know, or you would say, I've gone through religious phases, but I'm not, then here would be my recommendation to you. Don't take the bread and the cup, take Jesus instead. If you're not a believer today and you know it, maybe you say, yeah, I was baptized when I was a kid. I told God I was coming, but now I'm actually coming. All right, don't take the bread and the cup, take Jesus today. All right. Jesus at his last supper was telling his disciples about his banquet when he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. But this same Jesus is the one who told them that they could feast now when he said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And so if you're here today and you've heard the call and you've answered the call, so you are a believer. You've heard the call, you've answered the call, but you're not the beggar cheering at every plate. And you're certainly not able to smile at the guards. You would say, Sean, I fall more in the camp of someone who has declined, who is ignoring, and who's warring. If you would say that, let's ask Holy Spirit right now to make the banquet real to you. And as we take this bread and cup, this little simulated banquet, May we pray that our lives be characterized by feasting on it now. May we truly taste and see that the Lord is good and may it no longer be an abstraction to us, amen. Make it real to our heart, Lord. Tell the Lord today that you're coming, amen. And so my friends, Pat and Bev, Tenet, they're gonna come forward, they're gonna lead us in this. Why don't we stand together? Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Ephesians 1.7 says, In Jesus Christ we have redemption through his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. 
Jesus didn't die just for our sins. He also died as our sins. Yes. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Jesus the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. So in this Thanksgiving season, it seems appropriate and from the message today that um, we just marvel at, at what he did. Yeah. I can't imagine being without God, but he made a way not just to pay for our sin, to pay the penalty of our sin, but to give us the pathway to a relationship with him. So God, we just thank you. We marvel at your salvation. We marvel at your sacrificial gift of shedding your blood to save us and bring us in relationship with you. We will never be separated from you. And we are just astounded and thankful by your amazing grace and your amazing love. Let's take the This communion is a reminder, elements, a physical reminder of a covenant that God made with us. The blood, something we couldn't pay for. The mercy that he showered on us will always, always be at the foot of the cross thanking him because Jesus got what we deserved. The other part of the element, though, the, the bread, the bread of life, the daily bread that Jesus talks about in the, the first prayers that he instructs his apostles with is the covenant is the other part. It's grace. It, it's the exact opposite in a way of, of mercy. Mercy is where Jesus got what I deserved. Grace is where I get what Jesus deserved. Yeah. And this is where we, this is the other part of the, why we're here. It's uh, Jesus took our sin away. Huh. We get to be Jesus here on earth. Yeah, wow. And it's not that God hasn't given his power. He's sealed us with the Holy Spirit. He says in Colossians, he says, He will continually fill you with all the power of his glorious might that you may patiently endure any hardship joyfully yeah. because you will bring his presence and change your circumstance. That is the part that we are, to mull when we can put this, element in our mouth. Amen. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. With the pastor in front dropping the bucket. <laughs> if you're here today and you would say, Sean, Sean, I want to I want to go to this banquet. That if if God is throwing a royal feast for his son and he's invited me. I want to come. And maybe to this point I've said I'm coming before, but it, but I've not really meant it. But I know that I'm someone who is more in that space of declining and ignoring and warring, but I don't want to do that anymore. I want to say, yes, I'm coming and I'm truly coming. If you would say that to you today, just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray. Our prayer team's going to come down and there'll be people that you guys can, uh, that you can come and pray with. This is my last call. I'm coming, God. Raise your hand. I see you. I see you, sister. And if you're here, you would say, no, I, I, I've been walking with God for a while. I've been walking with God for a while, but my priorities, my, I've been preoccupied. And it's been getting in the way of me truly saying yes. Or you would even be willing to admit, and this is hard to get Christians to do, but you would even admit, no, I, I'm walking in a lot of pride, right? 
but I am that guy who would have been so bold as to walk into the banquet without clothes, but I have to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And so I've already told God I'm coming, but I want him to know afresh I'm coming. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you as well. I want to pray for you. Amen. 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 So Lord Jesus, we just present to you your beloved church. God, we thank you that you know the hearts of every person in this room. And God, we just ask that you would teach us, that you would be with us, Lord, that as we abide, I love how it says to abide as you abide in us. Lord, we need you to dwell richly in our hearts, God. That if it's true that we have the opportunity to feast now, God, teach us what that looks like. Help us to not be people who get so consumed with the circumstances, the things around us that we don't actually cultivate, God, what you have given us to cultivate. Help us to be people who are beggars at every dish, who just recognize the amazement of being able to walk with you and know you and have a relationship with you, uh, uh, being able to do that right now. We don't have to just wait for a day, and we're all waiting, but we can have, we can taste it now. Lord, help us to be people who smile at the guards. Amen. So we just thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said.